this approach is very similar to that. So it's identifying and tracking key business model hypotheses, testing and validating your hypotheses with customers, and pivoting and iterating based on the feedback you receive from customers. And I won't go into depth because that's going to be gone into later. Um, all right. So I won't go into depth on this one either, but it's, like I said, much different than the traditional kind of, you've heard of probably business planning or business plans. That is something that we don't at the Rollins Center encourage you to do. Because what, when, you, when you create big, thick business plans, you fall in love with them. You kind of like fall in love with a car or something. Anyways, you take all this time doing all this research, maybe you know, at the library, and you're just writing this perfect essay, and it's just fantastic, and it's 50 pages, and it's wonderful, and you take it to an investor, and the problem is, is you've not spoken with it, probably anyone about whether all of that stuff in there is true or not, and it has any, um, you know, whether anyone will actually pay you for any of that. And so that's what uh, we want you to be doing, is focusing on the customer. So, what is the timeline? This is important. December 4th, that's what we're doing right now, how to win the BMC session workshop. January 16th is a submission help session and workshop that will you'll be uh, bringing your submissions to where you're at that point, and we'll just have people there to help you look over and you know work on your submissions. January 25th is the submission deadline uh, on the uh, Miller Competition Series website. January 26th to February 1st, we'll have internal judging. February 3rd, the top five will be announced. February 4th to February 12th, the top five will do pitch prep with a number of uh, top um, uh, pitch prep folks. And then February 13th is your final event. Uh, and that's, that is the timeline. Now, at that final event, we will announce sixth through 10th place. Uh, because you'll see here in a second that actually there's prizes from 6 through 10, but you won't know, and I apologize, but you're going to carry it over your heads. You won't know if you're going to be 6 through 10, but you will find out at the final event if you're going to be 6 through 10 place. All right, what are the judging criteria? Number one, did the team use a canvas, and we're going to talk about what that is here in a second, to map out their validation journey? Number two, throughout their validation journey, did the team identify and focus on the riskiest hypotheses, those that will kill their business in the following areas. Desirability, do people want it? Viability, will people pay for it? And feasibility, can we build it or can you build it, right? Next, did the team design and run experiments or tests, you'll see those words and use interchangeably, testing or experiments, to validate the risky assumption, assumption or riskiest hypotheses in the following areas. Same thing, desirability, unique value proposition, Viability, pricing, feasibility, and the MVP and prototype, right? Uh, next, did the team make evidence-driven course corrections, iterations, or pivots? So let's say you spoke to a bunch of people and you, you know, heard from multiple people the same thing about you know, what you're doing is wrong and you should change it to this other way. You know, did you then make a course correction um, with your business model? Um, the, the judges want to hear the learnings that you're taking from customers and how you're changing your model based on the, the feedback you're receiving. Um, all right, next. Does the team's level of traction, letters of intent, purchase contracts, sales, partnerships, etc., match their progression in their validation journey? So, as you're gaining, you know, validation. You know, are you actually moving your business forward, or are you just continuing to just test and test and test? Because one thing that we have noticed with this approach to entrepreneurship is you can kind of fall into this trap where you just think you have to keep testing and testing and testing. And one of the things about this competition is we want you to be nimble. We want you to be. We want you to move fast. Once you feel like you have, you know, validated certain areas, we want you to move on and, and you know do early do early things to actually see if customers are willing to pay. Maybe you do some, uh, you know, landing fake landing pages where you collect, you know, uh, payment and people actually start paying you. With, but you know, they go to a place where it says, "Oh, sorry, we're out of the product." But you know, join our mailing list will let you know when the price. You know, you're testing your willingness to pay, right? Um, or maybe you're doing a Kickstarter. Things like that. You know, are you doing those things um, as you're validating your business model? Um, and that's a key thing that we've changed from years past uh, to this year. 
Next, is the team solving a significant problem defined in terms of money or impact? We want you to be going after big markets. Um, now, some of you aren't going to be doing that, but we want to encourage here at BYU for you guys to think bigger. We want, you know, we want to impact the world and help, you know, and entrepreneurship is a way to do that. Entrepreneurship is a way to help uh, many people in the world. Um, and in fact, you know, Scott, maybe tell you a little more about that and how um, entrepreneurship can impact the world, even help things like world hunger and things like that. But next, did the team articulate a clear set of next actions in their validation journey and articulate a high-level plan to get there? So we want to see, like, if you didn't get to all the areas of the canvas, what are the what are the next testing that you're what is the next testing you're going to do, and how are you going to go about that? Um, what are your next steps, your next plans? Okay, all right. This is the Lean Canvas. How many here are first Lean Canvas? Okay, all right, wonderful. Uh, this was created by uh, Ash Moria. Um, Ash is one of our great friends here at the Ronald Center here at BYU. And you'll see that this canvas can be laid out in such a way that you, uh, the areas that we talked about, feasibility, desirability, and viability, are outlined on the canvas, right? So on the left side, that's dealing with feasibility. Right side, desirability. Down here, viability. And so those are the areas of the canvas as you go about validating that you're going to want to focus on those different, um, as we talked about in the judging criteria, right? Any questions about this? Okay. All right. Next, what does a submission include? It's a five to eight minute video outlining and explaining your validation journey. So, you know, we thought that people, that, you know, women in age 25 to 35 would want this product, and we went out and, you know, spoke with men, you know, how did you go about continuing to, like, you know, further test that? And you're going to go from test. Basically, it's kind of a, um, we used to call it, uh, what is it, HT, HTR, hypothesis test result. So you make a hypothesis, you test it, and then you get a result. And what did you do because of that? And then you, you, do, you, cre you create a new hypothesis, and you test, and result, hypothesis test result. And you're doing that in each of the different areas of the canvas. And, um, you're, gonna, and you're gonna learn more about, okay, what kind of test should I do if I'm trying to find out you know, certain things? And that's what uh, Eric and others were going to. But um, the video is a narrated slide presentation. So PowerPoint, um, I can't remember Mac, what's it called? What's the software presentation software? Keynote. Keynote, thank you. So Keynote, you can do, you'll, you'll have your slides and you'll narrate uh, your voice over those and then create it into a video in five to eight minutes. And your submission should show that you have tested all or most of the areas of the canvas. Okay? All right, what are the cash prizes? This is a change from years past. So one thing that we're doing at the Rollins Center is we're not trying to pick winners. We, have, we recognize that we're not good at doing that. So what, what do we do? We buy the market. We buy, we give, you know, more money to more, to more winners. Um, does that make sense? And so, you know, in the past we've given like ten or $10,000 to first place. Well, guess what? Sometimes that person doesn't actually win in the real world. So we're better, we, we feel like it's better to give you know, more people, um, flash out with more, more people. So first place is $4,000. That will be determined at the final event. So you'll see second through fifth place, all $3,000. So everybody going to the finals gets $3,000. Those final judges will determine the extra $1,000 that goes to the winner. Does that make sense? Then you have six through 10, $800. So total cash prize is $20,000. All right, good resources to use. Um, the BMC Global website. Some of you have probably heard of the International Business Model Competition, so IBMC. That, that competition was just rebranded to BMC Global, so businessmodelcompetition.com is the website. Uh, that has amazing resources there, um, especially past winter videos. Um, those are going to be extremely useful uh, for you. Tools, main canvas we talked about. And these are some other tools that we'll send to you if you give us your email here uh, when, when the time's appropriate. So experiment picker, wow factor test. Okay, books. These are really important that you're familiar with the concepts in these books. Nail it and scale it by Nathan Furr and Paul Alstrom. Talking to people and testing with people. Two different books by Gift Constable. I will say that the number one thing that people get wrong, they just don't do well, is customer going out and speaking with customers. How do you do those interviews? What should you do in those interviews? What kind of you know, validation should you be doing? Um, that, that, those books are great, talking and testing with people. A new book that just came out, David Bland, Alex Osterwalder, Testing Business Ideas, fantastic. It, uh, that actually is a 
wonderful book about how to, you know what kind of different experiments you should do based on what kind of uh, what kind of area you're testing of your business model. Fantastic book, just barely came out. Um, David Bland is also one of our judges for the business model competition book. All right, that's all I have. Um, I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Scott Peterson. We'll uh, save uh, questions to the end. Um, it is awesome to be with you guys today. Uh, we have some, I think, some really good content. I just uh, finished an interview today with one of the former MBA students that had started a business uh, back in like 2015, and he's on to a new business now. They're doing about 500 ARR and uh, and re uh, recurring revenue and growing uh, rapidly. Notwithstanding all of that, you know, I shared with him uh, quite a bit of what I'm going to share with you today, and it was really valuable to him. Don't underestimate, you know, some, when Vince Lombardi stood in front of uh, his football team in 1965, he basically held out the football and he said, gentlemen, this is a football. We're going to focus on blocking and tackling, passing and blah, blah. I just went to the basics. That's what I'm going to do today is I'm going to take you through some steps that uh, I have learned through building seven different companies. Um, and uh, so... First, I want to introduce you to the startup model, which many of you have probably seen, and some of you might not have seen. And since I don't know who's seen it and who hasn't, uh, if I'm showing it to everybody. But first of all, we're going to cover the principles of idea, idea development and early testing. So I want you to think about that. It is a segment all into itself. If you think of it differently than that, you'll make mistakes. Okay? I'm just saying. And those mistakes will cost you money, and they'll cost you time. And I'm trying to help you bridge so that you don't lose millions of dollars as I have done and take too long as I have done. Uh, that's the beauty of you know, having experience is if you listen because you're humble and you're willing to take advice, then you will make less mistakes and you will spend less money and make more money. Uh, and the reason these are segmented is because it helps you to visualize the company formation from the beginning and get it right. The second segment is business model validation and customer development. Notice that we talk about validation and customer development. Customer development is actually selling to customers. So if you're not selling to customers, you're not learning about what it means to go into customer development uh, and you won't know how to you know, take your company to the point where it can begin to scale. You might get lucky and do it, but my experience is, is that it's better, there's three states of being. One is not knowing that you're not any good, is not being good and not knowing it. And that's a bad place to be in, isn't it? The other is that you're not very good, but at least you know it. That's okay. The best place to be is to be good, but not just to be good, to know why you're good. And that's what this, this, that's what this talks to, is you have to know why you're good, and you have to know why you're going through the process that you're going through, so you can see yourself going through the process. And that's all I'm going to go into right now, is uh, then the building of the early infrastructure, which we won't really talk about today. All right, so there's what I call the fifth point of the compass. Anybody know what the fifth point of the compass is? Unless you've been in my class, you can't answer it. Anybody know what the fifth point of the compass is? <laughs> is it the one that's, that sits and moves? It's like... <laughs> good answer, but no. <laughs> it's like the cardinal points is like the one that... No, but that's a good answer. It's, it's, a hard, it's a hard question if you haven't been exposed to it. Anybody else? It's got to get one the back. Is it the one that keeps it centered? Nope. A lot of people think at the center. It's where are you now? So you have to think about two points on the compass. It doesn't matter where you're going if you don't know where you are. You have to know where you are and where you're going. So every one of you are at a very different point in your customer journey right now. So you have to know where you are now and then where you're going to go and then how you're going to chart the course to get there. All right, then um, I want to go through this. This has taken a few years to perfect, uh, but it's a, it's a pretty good model. So we're going to start up in the uh, corner up here, 
And before you start a business, if you don't go through the hard process, and it's not that easy, of identifying every single competitor who's in the space, then you'll make big mistakes. So you list all the customers, and you list all the things that they are doing. Uh, everything that you know of that you think that they're doing uh, and or not doing. But what you're going to do is you're going to draw those circles up there and that's where you have scratched out on a napkin and said, I've got some amazing ideas. Uh, I think that they're screwed up here, 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 and here. And uh, I think that these four or five points uh, will revolutionize or change the way that things are done today. Um, I've had a couple different business where that, where that was the case, where we just changed the way an entire industry did stuff. And you have the opportunity of doing those kinds of things. But you, in the beginning, they are only hypothetical. Because you think that you, on, you're on to a great idea, but you don't know yet if it is a good idea or if it will work. We always like to say, we want you to fall in love with the problem, not fall in love with your idea. Remember that. Don't fall in love with your idea because it most likely will be wrong, but fall in love with the problem. Because if you fall in love with the problem, you'll get passionate about different ways to solve it. So you're noticing up there what's available today. You're noticing the holes that you think. Notice up there I've written in there, those are gaps in service, opportunities that you have observed that perhaps others haven't seen, and differentiators which equal new features, right? New features to a product. So this really won't matter whether this is a physical product or whether this is software or hardware or a combination of both. So then notice we've got this arrow that draws down and as soon as we have developed what we think are those key gaps and that have been great opportunities, we're gonna use this FAB model up here, feature, advantage, and benefit. And right from the get-go, I'm going to show you how to sell something that doesn't exist. We're talking about the emperor with no clothes, okay? And we're going to teach you how to sell that right now, today. So it's basically being able to say, John or Julie, today you're able to do this, right? So you're speaking to the customer, a real customer. And you're getting this kind of a result, or you're asking the question, what kind of a result are you getting today? This is what you're doing. What kind of result are you getting? Is it working for you? What do you like about it? What don't you like about it? And then you have the opportunity to be able to say, John, Julie, here is what's available today. Tomorrow, you're going to be able to do this. And the advantage of doing this over this is this. And the economic benefit is this. And I want you to lock that into your memory, okay? Because right there, you've developed a statement that allows you to create value. For example, in, uh, in, in my company, Omadi, we uh, develop towing software, field services management. We're connecting all of the uh, tows that go across the whole country with the insurance industry, all the people that serve them, the towing providers, and so forth. So in the early days as we were building out our TMS, the towing management system, we noticed that, um, and this was a few years ago, that um, you know, towers, who I'm pretty sure you guys don't like, you know, because if they've towed your car before, you know, because you've been parking in the wrong spot or whatever, nobody really likes that person that does that. And, and so towers were notorious for stealing for, for improperly towing vehicles. And there was really nothing to hold them to account. So what our software did is we, we first of all put in place geofencing. So that the minute they would pull into a property, the rules of the property would automatically populate. And it became impossible for the people, the towers, to tow a car unless it was actually, you know, in uh, breaking the rules of the property. And, and then it forced you to take pictures which were date stamped and time stamped and, uh, and, uh, and couldn't be altered and um, so that there was proof. And so then there's what we call give backs, okay? So give backs is where a tower would tow the car and then the uh, 
tenant would complain and say, I wasn't parked there, I didn't make that mistake, you know, blah, blah, blah. And the, the, um, the uh, owner of the property wanting to keep his tenants happy would call up the tower and say, listen, you gotta bring that back. And oh, by the way, you're not gonna get paid for it. And oh, by the way, if you wanna keep the contract with this property, property you're gonna bring it back, right? So now the tower has already towed the car and now they're gonna have to give it back and they're not gonna make any money and they had two you know, experiences where they had to engage and it cost them a minimum of like 300 bucks an occurrence. And so I would ask towing properties, how often does this happen? Uh, I mean, to a particular tow company. Oh, a couple times a week, maybe three times a week. Oh, so you're <coughs> anywhere from six to nine hundred bucks, a thousand dollars a week that you're spending right now on it. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. That sounds pretty expensive to me. It is. We hate it. So when we developed our software, it made it impossible for there to be give backs because everything was date stamped and time stamped. Not only that, they didn't lose any more court cases. Zero. They lost court cases all the time before that. So now when I'm creating value for my customer, I'm able to say, John, today you've got these give backs and they're costing you anywhere from six to 900 bucks a week. Isn't that right? Yeah, that's, if you could solve that, would that be important to you? Yeah, yeah, that'd be fantastic. Well, tomorrow you're gonna be able to not have those give backs ever. And so you're gonna pick up anywhere from three to 4,000 a month. How would that be? Of course they wanna see, that's exciting. So now you can see, I've been able to say, here's what's available today, to, and this is what you're doing to, here's what you're doing now. Um, tomorrow you're gonna to be able to do this. And the advantage of doing this over this is this, and the economic benefit is this. Now, that's just one feature. That's just one feature. How much does my product cost them? Well, maybe a thousand bucks a month, okay, in, in a SaaS product. So how hard is it now for me to sell that product and to get the customer to say, yes, I'm signing up, when they're spending 4,000 a month or 3,000 a month on one feature and I'm gonna give that back to them. Do you see what I'm saying? That's the advantage, and I'm doing that before I have a product. And what does that allow me to do? It allows me to see if there really is the problem that I perceive there is. Does that make sense? All right, now, so we go in and we create these, and, and you're never gonna build a company on one or two features. Unless you have you know, some impactful three to five things, you probably aren't going to change uh, people out of the course of what they're currently doing. Because it's hard to change customer behavior. Can I repeat that? It is hard to change customer behavior. So in order to do that, you have to have something that's more than just a little bit good. You have to have something that is really good. All right? All right, so now, now that we've done that, we've got these hypothetical statements that we've built out but that we don't know for sure are true yet. So now I'm gonna talk briefly about this brainstorming process that you've been going through. And the purpose of me doing this is for you to, for me to take you where, where you are today and improve on that position, okay? So the first thing is we're identifying a big problem. Why? Because you can either solve you know, a small problem, make a million dollar, I mean, you can have a million dollar company and it will take you every bit as much energy to build a million dollar company as it will a hundred million dollar company. I promise. And so which would you prefer? Yeah, all right. So let's think bigger than you think and uh, recognize that you have the power to change the world. Plenty of seats here. One over here, so there's a couple down here. Okay, so, so now we are, the next thing that we're gonna do is we're brainstorming. And there is a very specific order to this, all right? So let's say that I'm in uh, my, our, our, our war room. I call it the war room with my team. And we've got whiteboards all around or we've got sticky notes or whatever it is that we have, but we gotta be able to throw everything out there. And everything is fair game. Everything is fair game. You don't wanna restrict your thinking at this point. You just wanna get it out there and uh, put it up on the wall and, and then 
once you've got it up on the wall, now we're into innovation. Now, innovation is bringing into existence something that has not been in existence before. All right? So that, that's actually a huge thought, is that customers, you'll learn in these books that Jeff's been telling you about, they don't innovate, but they do validate. So who has to do the innovation? It's you guys. And the example that we often use is, is it wasn't, uh, Henry, you know, people weren't looking for a, a car when Henry Ford, you know, they didn't know it existed, but they were, would have been happy to have a faster horse, right? So that's what I want you to think about is that you're bringing something into existence. It can happen by matching a microwave with a dishwasher and you could sit there for hours with your team and say, what are we gonna do and build out of this? That's how innovation really starts. Um, it can also happen by looking at all these different companies out here and looking at what they're each doing and saying, well, this one does this and this one, but none of them are doing, you know, all of it together. Um, so innovation. Now we get into ideation. We're going to bring some human form to it. We're going to start taking all the stuff that we've thrown up on the wall and we're going to begin to organize it and uh, into where we think we have a, a business model or a product and then it's going to be iterative from there, iteration. We're going to keep improving it. And this is all in the idea stage, all of it. Okay? We finally get to this area of differentiation where we're able to take a look at all the companies that we developed over there and say, do we really have something different? Is this really a game changer? And then we're able to sit back and to say, um, all right, this is as good as we can kind of get it right now. Let's go out and do some early testing. Eric's going to talk about that in a little more detail than I am, about what that early testing may have looked like. But really, it's customer surveys. Uh, I don't do a lot of heavy one-to-one -one customer stuff yet. I might do more surveys uh, than anything at this point. But I have to learn to ask the right questions. And sometimes, it, the, the question is, can you ask the right question? Do you even know the right question? Um, and so it's actually saying to yourself, what is it that I don't know, and then know it? What is it that I don't know, and then know it? All right, now we get into this whole idea of, of you know, where we, and by the way, a good book here is The Innovator's DNA, and we're talking there about what is the Clayton Christensen's The Inner Innovator's Dilemma. How do you think that I consumed music when I was uh, a young teenager in junior high school? A track. Cassette. Records. Records. The early 70s, records. When I was in high school, it was A track tapes. When I came home from my mission, it was cassette tapes. About 1990, it was um, CDs. In about uh, a little, uh, just a few years later, it was Spotify, and it was, I mean, I mean it was, uh, um, it was uh, the Sony Walkman and the Apple iPods, and then today it's Spotify. So the job to be done, it never changed, did it? Okay, but how we solved that problem did change. All right, so now we go into some, some, some of this part that's getting more important. So we have a virtual prototype. We're gonna create spiritually what we hope to then create physically later. We're gonna, the earth was created spiritually before it was created physically. You build blueprints before you're gonna build a house. And that's what you're going to do. You're going to either build what we call wireframes. Anybody know what, everybody know what wireframes are for technology? So wireframes for technology are basically all the screenshots without any back-end development of what it's going to look like and how it will interface with the customer. And, and you're going to have everything that you unloaded into your uh, business model up there in the idea stage and you're going to get it out there in the best possible form, and you're going to start to take it out to customers. And then they're going to respond. And there are basically four different things that can happen. One is you are absolutely correct. It doesn't happen very often. 
Uh, another response is that you are dead wrong. This happens more often than you think. And this is really what happens more often is you're partly right and partly wrong, meaning that if you are off by you know, two degrees, you hit the mountain instead of the city, right? If you're flying an airplane. So finally then, you learn something new that you never anticipated. So this is uh, actually really important. And Eric, again, I'm not going to steal his thunder. He's going to go through some of this methodology of testing uh, so that you can make sure that after you build out this virtual prototype, that can work with the product also. It can be a 3D bit printed version that you're actually now taking out to customers one-on-one -on -one, and you've developed all these questions and you are in the process of massively learning. You are in the process of, of, um, of changing an industry perhaps. You're in the process of being covert and being out there, you know, just trying to change an industry, this research part. So then I'm going to take all the learnings and I'm going to create VP2, Virtual Prototype 2. And I'm going to take it back out to more customers, some of the same customers, and more new customers. And then finally, I'm going to build an MVP. And when I build an MVP, it's going to be a real product that I can sell. If it's a technology product, like a software product, I'm only going to sell it to five customers. And I'm going to go deliver the value that I promised that I was going to deliver. And I'm going to see if I can get the customer to be full on happy, a raving fan, by using you know, the product that I created. They're paying for it. Maybe less, maybe they're a Lighthouse customer, but they have some dog in the hunt. They're committed you know, to being an early customer and helping you with the developed product. Well, why is this important? of building this real MVP because now you have people actually using it and they can tell you the real experience that they're having they can come back with real feedback and 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 this gives you an opportunity to onboard your customer and prove to them that you can deliver the value by the way there is an order of things as you go into building the early infrastructure and you're going to put early money into product development next into onboarding and cut client success, then into marketing and then into sales. And that is counterintuitive to a lot of people, including me, only just a few years ago with my technology company. Because I thought once I had a hundred raving fan customers that I would put a lot of money into sales, all that did was expose that I had bugs in my product, that my product architecture wasn't right on the uh, on the uh, um, mobile app that I use Drupal instead of maybe uh, uh, Angular or Node or React, you know, it would have been much better uh, code basis for me to use for that. Drupal was much too clunky, hard to be skipped to scale, hard to find good people, it just it was a terrible decision in my CTO that I say. Um, and it costs a lot of money, okay, and it costs a lot of time. And then um, I found out that because you know, my, my onboarding was clunky because my out-of-box experience with my product wasn't good, all right? And, and then I didn't have a big marketing team or a good marketing uh, program yet, so I'm putting all this money into sales, but I'm catching everybody at the beginning of the buyer's journey. I call that the headbanging. By the way, I did have brain surgery only three weeks ago where they took out a golf ball here, so I hope I had another one of these on this side. It could be a baseball, but that's how it goes. So, you know, three weeks out, I'm doing pretty good, I think you would admit. So, um, um, so at any rate, um, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm, I've got a good marketing program, then I'm getting all these leads, and instead of catching them at the beginning of the buyer's journey, I'm catching them in the middle. What does that do for me? That allows me, they're interested, so there's no headbanging, and I have a much better chance of, of closing the deal in a shorter period of time, and I am able to predict my sales, you know, uh, so that my pro formas, uh, actually, I can hit them, and I can tell you this, investors really like that, and they really don't like it if you don't hit your sales targets. And so, 
So there is an order of things that makes it work more efficiently. And it's not that you're going to be not selling. You're just not going to invest a lot of money into it. You, as the CEOs of your company, are going to be the chief sales officers. And you're going to go out and sell this stuff to your early customers. And you might have one or two salespeople, but you're not going to start to hire a big sales force until you have got the early infrastructure right. Anyway, going back to here, so you can see how we sandwich and we get it over to here, is that we, um, we've got our minimum, no, we're going to take it to a minimum sellable product now. So I've currently had it to five. I made all these fixes that I identified because of the, all of the, uh, all of the rapid tests that I developed. And by developing those rapid tests, and by putting that out in front of the customer and actually getting usage, I'm really getting a lot of really good feedback by now. But I can't build a platform on five customers. I told that to my Amati team just a, a few weeks ago. I said, you got to have 30. Otherwise, what you're doing is you're developing, you're being a dev shop for four or five customers when we need 30 to develop trends in the industry, to understand where the whole industry is going and how our product can be truly attractive to everybody. So once I've done that, I've made all these changes, then I go back, finish the coding, make all these changes. Now I've got, I'm going to sell it to 20 people. Now I've got a big enough base that I'm really going to learn a lot. And so I take it out there. They might be discounted again. And I may or may not choose to use them as lighthouse customers, um, meaning for free. Um, but at the end of the day, I want this now in the hands of a lot more people going through all these questions and determining that, fixing them, and then eventually ending up with a map a minimum awesome product. It doesn't have all the features yet, but every feature we do have is, is awesome, and it delivers the value, and it's not clunky. It's a good out-of-box experience. One of the big surprises to me in my, techno in my second te technology company, because it's a long story, so I'll just keep it at that, is, is that um, people would actually pay for something. It's like going to buy a car, putting it in the garage and not draw, not driving it. It happens. It happens. I was just talking to this uh, to uh, Zach Oates, the guy that I was visiting with at lunch, and he said, yeah, this is so surprising to me too. And I said, that is illustrative, illustri illustrative or whatever, illustrative, of um, the fact that your dev is clunky and your Onboarding is not going well because your out-of-box experience isn't good. A lot of pause there and thought. Um, so now that we have this map, we're prepared to go build the early infrastructure. So that's the purpose of this. And I know it was remedial in some respects for some of you, and yet I'm sure that there's at least something that you all took away from that. So we're going to go to the next slide this lean canvas that you all are aware of, this is, I like this one because of how it's organized. And if you look at the number one thing, and you go back here and you say, oh, what did Scott do? And I did this, by the way, years ago before Ash did, just so you know I'm not stealing from Ash. What's available today? What are the holes? In other words, what's the problem? Notice that that's exactly where Ash starts. What are the top three problems? And he says, what are the existing alternatives? Didn't we already do that in that map that I gave to you? And then he goes into, what are the customer segments? Well, you know all of that. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time. But this is organized in a very important way. And so when you go to the business model competition and use the canvas, it's designed to de-risk your business. So that instead of 9 out of 10 or more companies failing, that if you do this process correctly, then really, you should make it. Why? Because you'll quit before you start. Do you get that? That's not failure. If you work for three months on a business project, 
and you come to the conclusion that it's not going to work because the riskiest assumption doesn't, doesn't pan out, you're going to be a good entrepreneur and go on to the next idea. That make sense? Therefore, you didn't fail. So if you actually get to the point where you use the entire canvas and actually work on this in the way that we've talked about, there's a really, really good chance you'll succeed. It's still hard. Now, when you go to the canvas here, you see the key metrics area, number eight? Well, these are the key metrics. These are some of the key things that you're going to look at. And so I've included it in our, in our uh, presentation there. And by the way, you are going to get all of these slides. So the next thing is the methodology for validation, because uh, Eric, again, is going to go into some nuts and bolts. But you design your validation process as though you're right. But you test it as if you're wrong. Because you don't want to do it in such a way where you stack the deck in your favor. You want to be a little bit pessimistic and realistic and not overly optimistic that you got it right. Now, let me clarify something. In building a company, one of the greatest attributes that you will ever develop is optimism. My son would often say, as he was an early founder with me in Omadi, that, Dad, this and this and this, and I say, don't worry about it. It's all going to work out. And it's not going to be easy. And there are going to be a lot of problems that are going to crop up along the way. But honestly, if you keep putting one foot in front of the other, you're going to get there. And then we go to the hypothetical inputs. What are your specific insights and innovations? And what are the changes that you're proposing to the industry? And what impact will this create? And what metrics will determine success or failure? And you need to maximize the, the rate of learning by minimizing the time to try things. In other words, you're not going to take two hours to watch 60 minutes. Uh, <laughs> Everybody knows that that's a show, right? Yeah. You're not going to take two hours to watch 60 minutes. You're going to go get it done. And then, is this the smallest thing that we can do to test our riskiest assumption? So here's some, some tips that I've got. You have to develop the big idea. If you're going to win the business model competition, you're going to have to learn how to present and tell stories. It's about telling your journey from where you started, the first thought, the first inkling uh, that you had uh, uh, a, big, a big idea, how it started, what you thought about it, what your early assumptions were, how you went out to test them, how those informed you, what you did about it, what you did next in your test, how that informed you, and you keep going until you're you're done but it's in storytelling language so you clearly communicate your first and subsequent hypotheses you clearly communicate your early tests um, the reason I'm not spending a lot of time here on this is because you're gonna have this in front of you then we're gonna have you watch some videos and you're gonna see these inside of the videos and so they will do the explaining <clears throat> You're going to communicate your learnings, how they informed your customer development, and finding product market fit. Now, I want you to remember that word, finding product market fit. This is the most difficult thing that you will have to do. Um, you, to find product market fit, you can find product fit, but unless you find market fit with it, it doesn't work. You can find market fit, but if you don't find, find product fit, it doesn't work. You've got to have product market fit. They both have to fit, and this is a journey, and it's hard. But if you stay the course, you'll get there. You communicate your pivots and your model changes. You communicate later testings, learnings, iterations, and outcomes. And this is important. You communicate traction of every kind in your presentation. Now, I want you to think about this. The canvas is meant to de-risk your business. If there is any part of that canvas that has not been derailed, you don't know if you are going to fail or not. Because it may very well be that in one of those segments on the, on the canvas that you didn't de-risk, and it's not proven out by experience and by validation, you don't know. 
And so the winners of the competition are going to de-risk virtually the entire <coughs> campus, certainly most of it. It's a short time, so. This, uh, and then we create the, an awesome presentation that a child could follow. Let me, <coughs> let me explain that. You're going to get down into the weeds, and you're going to be in the weeds for months. And then you're going to come out of the weeds, and you're going to start making a presentation. <coughs> and then what you're going to find is, is that you communicate over the top of their head. Because they haven't done the work you've done. It's like if you were a child reading a newspaper, but you weren't aware of all the stuff that's going around in the world. And so it wouldn't make any sense to you. There's nothing for your brain to attach to. So you have to speak simply so that, as I like to say, a 10-year-old or a 90-year-old could get it. And I say that correctly because sometimes I could even say 60-year-olds like myself, you know, because if you speak too much techno technologically, it'll go over my head. Right, Jeff? <laughs> Anyway, that's the point on that. And then to check out what Jeff has already told you about, um, there's, a check, there's a how to win the BMC checklist, but what I want to point you to more is those videos. So hear me, I, I gotta say this as clearly as I can. I have never seen, after giving this pitch, anyone come back to me and give a business model pitch that was worth the powder to blow it up. Not one. Let me give you an example. Last year, in the top five, not one of them was what I would consider worth the powder to blow them up, and this is in the finals. They were terrible. All of them. <laughs> and this is the finals. So, I talked to the girls' company who was in the finals, at all of you, are you familiar with the girls? You will be uh, once you see the videos. They won $40,000 at the International Business Model or the Business Model, uh, the BMC Global Finals. $40,000. And you know what? They almost didn't get in. Period. Because they came to me about two weeks, maybe ahead of time. And they, I had already talked to them and told them and all the teams that the presentations were junk. One of the things you'll learn about me is that I tell it straight. Not be, uh, I, I tell you right up front, I love you, and people that get to know me know that the, that's not a platitude and it's not something that I just say. It's true. And I prove it. I prove it because I'm here basically working for free and have been for 10 years. And I also prove it because I'm willing to spend whatever it takes, as long as it's legal, moral, ethical, and not too fatty. <laughs> and I'm willing to put in the time, and I tell them I love them because I mean it. But I'm also straight, because if I'm not straight, then I'm just fooling you, and you're not going to learn anything, and you're not going to get anywhere, and the marketplace will crush you. And the marketplace doesn't care how much effort you put into it. The marketplace will crush you. And so I think it's actually noble, benevolent, and kind to hit you right between the eyes before the marketplace <coughs> kills you and you spent a lot more time and money. So that's how I was with the girls, and they almost cried. I'm not going to lie to you, they just about cried. And I, I told them, I said, listen, I told you two months ago that your presentation <coughs> stunk. And it wasn't just you, it was all of them. And it, you haven't done anything about it. And you're going to be <coughs> competing against these global competition people. They know how to do this thing. And they will get it right. And you will look like garbage in front of them. I'm not going to embarrass Brigham Young University or you by putting you out there. <coughs> we promise. We're going to get it right. We're going to do it. I mean, they just begged. And, and a few days later, it wasn't hardly anything better. And I rehearsed with them all over again what to do. And I said to them, you have until here. If you're not done with it here, 
I'm not letting you in. And so they actually followed my direction, did what I asked them to do, and they, and they had, uh, uh, what at that point was, was a really good presentation that was then going to get a lot better. So I spent lots of time with them iterating on their presentation so they could take credit for all the good work that they had done. Because the presentation is what allows you to be able to take credit for what you've been done. If you do a poor presentation, you may have done the hard work. It's just they didn't, nobody knows because you didn't present it in a way that people could get it and really understand the value of what you've done. So, um, so after they had, you know, iterated probably five more times, you know, and this is actually, you know, we're now in the competition, they won and they killed it. So here's my advice to all of you right now. You go look at these past video winners, you look at the girls, you should go back to an early one. It's, it's done on uh, Alex Osterwalder's canvas, uh, but it still does the same thing for you. So uh, I'll let baby monitor. Today, they're a $90 million company. That they're only, you know, like five years old. And they're a $90 million company, but they did it right. They won the competition in 2013, and they have a $90 million company. So it's a good one to watch. And then I could say, go thou and do likewise. It means you have to start the presentation and stop it. And start it and stop it, and start it and stop it, and start it and stop it, and, stop it and say, well, here's mine. I'm gonna this. I'm gonna do this and match it up. I'm gonna do this and match it up. I'm gonna do this and match it up. And I'm gonna say, you know, is one of them like the other, or is, you know, one of them is not like the other. And you want to make sure that yours is like theirs. And if yours is like theirs, then you will be able to move forward in the competition. Now what's the advantage of that? And this is the last piece. We have this competition series because, because it matters. Um, this idea pitch that we had is designed to reward a great big scalable idea. The student innovator, uh, innovator of the year uh, held in the um, engineering college that we're partners in is designed to reward innovative technology, but technology by itself isn't a business. The app competition is designed to reward software and app innovation. Okay? And then the business model competition is designed to reward the correct process. The Miller New Venture Challenge is designed to be able to uh, reward traction, actual customers, actual contracts, actual um, partnerships with other companies and so forth, uh, patents or provisional patents. Um, the business model competition global is an extension of and a higher level competition of our business model competition here on campus. Just imagine if you finish the business model competition and you knock it out of the ballpark and now you've got three more months to go out and validate and test and get more traction and so forth, how you're going to compete on the global stage. You'll crush it, I promise. But if you wait until March to crush it, then you have no more, I mean, to try to crush it, you get no more traction. But if you spend the next two months of December and uh, January, all of it, just crushing it, and so let me tell you one of my favorite statements. Successful people are successful because they're willing to do the things that unsuccessful people are not willing to do. We even had a few people leave thinking they, maybe they know it. I don't know. I don't know why they left. Maybe they have something really important they had to go to. But at the end of the day, I'm pretty sure that there's something I've said in the last five or ten minutes that mattered to your ability to succeed. So the summer launch pad, we take the top teams out of uh, the business model, we take the, uh, who won the Miller New Venture Challenge, and they get in and to the, uh, the launch pad, and it's an intense course like Y Combinator. We give each of the, the winners of the New Venture Challenge 15 grand, and, and, and maybe more, who knows. Um, but the point is, is we do everything imaginable to help you succeed in your ventures. And this is a journey, and it's a process, 
and if you follow it, good things will happen. So, uh, that's all I have to, today. Eric's going to get in and dig in and do more. Um, I want to thank you for your attention, and I want to let you know that I'm at 470 in the Tanner Building, and I'm available to help you, and I'm here to help you. And so I hope that you will reach out to me. You can set up an appointment with Rose Blameyers, who is my uh, our office manager and my assistant that, that manages my calendar. And we'll make sure that we give you the help that you need to get where you need to go. We'll connect you with mentors. Believe me, we will connect you with mentors to help guide you. Some of you already are. Uh, true? Mike Morgan is helping perhaps some of you. And uh, we're committed to doing whatever it takes. Anyway, God bless you all and good luck. And I, uh, I, I hold you in high esteem that you're here wanting to do something that, that actually can change the world. idea throughout the class. Um, first off, just a little bit of my background. So, oh gosh, three years ago, I had a double dating app. I was the most genius idea ever. Who's working on their first idea right now? Okay, it's probably really dumb. And you probably think it's great right now, but in a year, you're going to look at it and be like, wow, I was dumb. I was so ignorant of how to do this. And so the whole thing is we have to get past that first idea to the second idea to the third idea, and it's a process. So I learned this process so well that I actually came up with this idea for Breast Jam, which was an expiration date bar could add on. I took it from zero to 40 days later, winning the new venture challenge, got $20,000, got investment offers for $500,000, $650,000. But I was probably more trained in what Scott was talking to you about pitching and how to pitch well and how to present your information well. And I knew that there were still holes in my validation. So I went out and I actually validated those parts which really actually invalidated my business. And about a month later, I pulled the plug on the whole operations. I became so good at validating businesses, though, that I, as I was using my money to now go test dozens of ideas, I started a consulting company um, helping people called Biofactor Consulting. And that took off, and it was taking all my time. And I said, hey, I don't want to do consulting. It's not scalable. So I uh, doubled my prices. People still kept coming. So I'm like, wow, it's cool. I don't have time. So I doubled my prices again, and people still kept coming. And so I came to the point where I said, okay, let's, let's shut this down and let's start up a, a new, more scalable firm called Venture Validator, which can actually do this and be a scalable venture. And so that's kind of my background. Um, last month I spoke at the Lean Startup Conference, which is kind of the pivotal uh, crux of what this industry is, Lean Startup. And I am starting to do validation workshops. So I know my stuff, I've got a good background. Now the thing is, can I teach you how to do it? Um, so what my company really focuses on is A, is your idea good? B, what messages should you market? And C, what price you should set? Now the reason why is because nine out of 10 businesses fail, but 42% of that failure occurs because of no market need. So the first assumption that everybody in this room should test is, do I have market desirability? Do I have a market need? And everyone thinks they do, but you gotta go get validation from your customer on if you actually do, and I'll tell you how to do that. Um, 
So just to let you know, this process can be tested with a variety of uh, ideas. Just my business alone is to test things from apps, to door gear, technology, um, really anything can follow in this process, which is why it's really, really important that you know the process. Because your first idea, the idea you're working on right now, is probably crap. It probably sucks. But if you know the process, then you can get to that next idea, and maybe the fourth or fifth idea, you actually find something that works. If you look at the competition winners for New Venture Challenge for Business Model Competition, it's usually the people who have now tried their second year. Everybody's first year, they go in with the mentality that they're going to change the world, they're going to have a billion dollar idea, and then they end up not even getting to the semifinals or the finals, and I was there too. And you think, wow, the judging, the judging's all messed up. Or wow, that team totally shouldn't be in there. Like, the whole thing's rigged. But really, it's just your own immaturity and not understanding how the process works. So we want to get you past that first idea and hopefully get you to something that actually works. Um, so we've gone over this in a, lean, in a nutshell. Lean Startup is realizing that with a new business, with a startup, you don't have a business model that's proven. Everything is assumptions. With a corporation, things are all proven. We know everything. It's just operations. Can we make this engine keep going? We actually have to build the engine in a startup. And we are inserting assumptions with that. So this is a super, super important graphic, and we're going to go over this. Um, essentially, uh, it teaches you why are we doing Lean Startup, and what is the next step for you. So I'll jump into this a little bit deeper. Um, the idea is that over time, we are de-risking our business and increasing the investment uh, size or, or the valuation of our company. Um, and through that, we have five stages of a business, idea, model, traction, build, scale. It's exactly what Scott was teaching. The only thing I'm adding in here is attraction stage. Um, and as you're going, uh, revenue ultimately is the best validation metric. Because if customers are paying for what you are offering, then obviously it's validation that everything's working. The hard part is that revenue means building product, and building product is very resource intensive. People waste millions of dollars on building product. BYU students waste much smaller amounts, but they waste all their savings building dumb products. Um, and we know that most startups are going to fail, so the idea is we want to predict failure or success as quickly and as inexpensively as possible. So we do that through a series of specialized interviews, surveys, and focus groups. Um, I will teach you today how to do some of the interviews. Uh, my company does the surveys, and I can also teach you uh, how to do the, the focus groups. It's a very specific process to find out if you have product market fit. Uh, it has a lot of nuances, though, so it's kind of hard to teach all in one, one day. Um, but then, if we, we do that, then we have rapid assumption tests or risk case assumption tests. Who knows what an MVP is? Okay, so MVP, minimum viable product. It is a huge buzzword lean startup that's way overused to say, hey, here's my first version of a way overbuilt product that I'm trying to pretend is an MVP and pass it off. People way overbuild MVPs. They're way more expensive than they actually need to be. So the idea is before we build an MVP, let's build a rapid assumption test. And the idea here is instead of testing the whole entire model, let's test one or two of the risky assumptions and uh, use some kind of Wizard of Oz magic to make the customer feel like they are experiencing the product, but maybe we're behind the scenes actually doing things manually. And we'll actually go over some of those today. Um, so, once you have paying customers, we continue to iterate and get traction that proves that we have a, a business model. And the thing is, as you go along the scale, you're increasing in time and money. All of your costs increase the further you go into these stages. And so doing full lean startup is a really big commitment and opportunity costs are big. Uh, as BYU students, you only have probably about one to two years to get a business right, to then say, yeah, I'm gonna jump ship and I'm gonna do this after college, or nope, I gotta go into corporate world and kind of work my way up. And both ways are okay, but I know a lot of people have that entrepreneurial spirit and wanna do it in college, so don't waste your whole junior year validating a stupid idea. Get past that in the first two or three weeks and then try maybe 10 ideas so that hopefully one of those works, and then you spend your senior year working on that, and you actually have the confidence to now not take that forward job. Um, so what we have here is stage gates. So 
We have the, the wow factor test, which we're going to go over in a second. If you get over a 7.5 on this test, then you have product market fit. You've passed that market desirability point, and you know, now I should get over into actually building rats and MVPs. Don't go build an MVP right now just because you can, because there's easier ways to find out if you should even build that. So many people build the wrong thing, and they might take three or four months to do that. So then the next one is, before you actually build and scale, you need um, your one prom score over 40%, which we're not going to get that really today. It's a fancy way of saying that your customers need to come, 40% of your new customers need to come from unpaid sources, or you can never, ever mathematically achieve that hockey stick growth. But that's way past the scope of where we're going at today. Um, so, like I said, the wow factor score is a product market fit metric. Uh, then the one problem score is a go to market fit metric. So the benefits of using these metrics is that you either arrive at success a lot quicker while giving away less capital, or you arrive at failure faster without wasting time. And both of those are successes. So let's dive in a little bit deeper. So interviews, surveys, and focus groups are hypothetical validation. So I was a judge last year at the International Business Model Competition, and we had the top 40 teams and then the top 20 teams out of 6,000 in the world. And they had the crappiest interview and survey structures. It was terrible. They were so leading. They were so messed up. And so it was really frustrating because you can get anybody to say anything you want in a survey if you design the right way. It's really the wrong way. And uh, so a lot of people end up actually skipping this completely because they don't know how to do it right and they can't get quality data and they go straight into building. They say, well, you know, customers always change their mind anyways, so let me just go build it. Which is okay if you can do it very cheaply, but a lot of times you can't. So there's a correct way to actually do this, but we're realizing that it's hypothetical validation. Technically, we're hypothetically asking somebody how they would act in the future. We need to get to actual validation, which is going to be this wrap and MVP type thing. Now, the difference with actual validation is we're not asking, we're observing. We're seeing how customers actually act in the real world. We're putting some type of part of our business in front of them, and they don't have to make a choice and actually back up what they said with their actions. So much, much stronger. In the overall scheme of things, you should get past this fairly quickly into the model stage. The hard part is it's really hard to score over 7.5 on the wow well factor test. My business has done, I think, 35, 40 tests. We've never had anybody go over an 8.6, and the average client that I test, they have a 6.8 on their first idea. So 6.8 isn't about a 7.5 threshold. You're not gonna be a, a viral success. So that's actually quite hard, and I would say, I would put money on the fact that 80% of your businesses right now couldn't pass this test. Um, which is why you guys should do it and be able to learn because you can actually pivot and iterate off that to make sure it does pass. But with that said, if you show up to the International Business Model Competition and tell everybody that you interviewed 300 people and done surveys with 2,000 people, people just kind of take it with a grain of salt. Because we know how biased your surveys can be and we know that you just went onto your Facebook friends list and sent it out to everybody we know that you just went to the Marriott School uh, messaging system in your IS-21 class and just sent everyone on Learning Suite a spam survey. And the data is just really, really bad. So unfortunately, a lot of the judges completely discount, it's rightfully so, but they discount your interviews, your surveys, and your focus groups because of how bad you can screw them up. So to win, you have to have this actual validation by getting a wrap and an MVP. And if you can do that, that's how you're actually going to win but we don't want to build this until we've actually passed the stage gate. Um, so, let's go over the wow factor test real quick. Um, who has an idea in here that the target market is college students? What's your idea? So, I find there's two problems that all college students have. One is being a major, and the other is uh, being able to apply for a job or know what jobs are available when you're Okay. So my, like, second problem. Okay. Who has another idea in here for college students? Okay. Um, so I have one. It's like, so it's kind of like an app. I mean, like, card you can put in your Apple Wallet or for Google Pay or whatever, but then it just combines everything for your student ID, and then also for dorm access, and then also for, like, tests. 
and then also for like Cougar Cash and just everything yeah. for a campus card. Is there is there anybody else real quick that has an idea for students in here? Yeah. Uh, textbooks are really expensive, so finding the best price or the lowest price on textbooks. Okay. And then I'm creating an interchangeable glasses or frames to create cheaper options for people, um, cheaper frames, cheaper glasses. Cat. All right, let's try yours. Lewis, right? Cat. So, um, I really, what you have to do for a wow factor test is three things. One, create a product description. I'll show you how to do that. Two, add screening questions. And then three, interview target market customers. Now, when I first had you guys interview somebody today, you guys did it likely wrong, or, or the reason why the, the feedback you got wasn't really good is because one, you didn't explain your idea probably in the correct way, and then two, you're asking the wrong person. If it's somebody who's not in your target market that gets past your screening questions, we don't care what their opinion is. I honestly don't care if you think my business idea is bad if you're never a customer. I only care if you are a customer. So, um, let's see. Okay, Liz, I want you to explain your idea using this product description. It has seven parts to it. This goes for any idea. It's something from blockchain to a dating app can be explained this way. And the way it goes is about one sentence on who your customer is, one to two sentences on what your problem is, one to two sentences on explaining the existing solutions and why they're inadequate at solving the, the pain, and then insert your company name with a one phrase solution description so if you were Google, it'd be something like um, you know, uh, a website that searches everything. And then you go to the details of your solution. This will be the bulk, probably two or three paragraphs is what you put here. And then one sentence summarizing the benefits, and then the cost. How much should customers pay, and price ranges are, are acceptable. Um, so just to kind of give you one quick example before you, before you do this. Um, Okay, can I have somebody read this? Can you read this? For airport travelers who use their laptops. Problem, it can be difficult to find power outlets in busy airports. Well, you can bring a uh, power bank to charge your cell phones, you can't charge a laptop. If you need to charge a laptop, you must search for an available outlet. When searching for an outlet, you usually have to sit far away from your gate. Solution, laptop power box. In each terminal, you can rent their laptop power box. <coughs> Swipe your card and unlock a power box. The power box sits on top of your suitcase and is secured to the bars of your luggage handle by a velcro, velcro strap. There are two outlets and two USB ports. The power box can last up to five hours of charging your devices before it needs to be exchanged in the kiosk. Now you can charge your devices while eating at a restaurant, walking between terminals, or sitting near your gate. Pricing, it costs $3 an hour. Okay, so with that and this picture, you guys now have a complete understanding of what this is. And if I were to now ask you screening questions, I could get you to rate its wow factor. And the wow factor question is, on a scale of one to 10, what's the wow factor for this product? Where one equals, and eh, that's boring, I'd never buy it. And 10 equals, wow, here's my credit card. If I were in an airport, I would buy that right now, or I'd rent that right now. And that question is really, really effective, and we'll talk about it in a second why. Um, Lewis, do you want to go over your idea of following this format? Let me go back to your thing. <clears throat> the first thing that before you uh, jump into it, could you explain to us who is in your target market and maybe some of the screen questions you would ask somebody to find out if they are in your target market? So I guess we would have two segments. One would be faculty because they have to have cards for their office for access to like random areas around campus or to give access to, I guess that's, okay, sorry. Okay, so let's go, let's go to this side. So students. So Okay, students and then faculty. Is it for so, all students? Or yeah, is it? all students. Okay, so everybody is in the target market right now. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and explain your idea. Um, okay, so the problem is that student IDs are just sometimes inefficient because when you try to use Cougar Cash like at vending machines, sometimes they don't work. Um, or just like having to check out at the Cougarie or other things just kind of annoying to use. So this would be able to use Apple Pay or Google Pay for instant um, like payments. And then you'd also be able to- A little bit closer. What's, what's the root of the problem? Make it short. A lot of times we way, way overemphasize the problem we talk I have clients that want to submit to me like a page of the problem. Okay. If it's your target market, they should be really familiar with the problem. If you mention it, then they should go, oh yeah, I totally, totally resonate with that. And what are the main problems? 
So with your idea, you can probably solve 15 IT problems. Yeah, there's a lot. What are the main problems that resonate with us in this entire market? Um, so, sorry, there, it just covers so many areas. I'm trying to say all these. So it's like your entire campus experience on one card. Okay. So that would be right here. Write a one phrase description. That'd be perfect. What What's the problem, though? It'd probably be that uh, campus students have so many cards to get access to so many different things. Something like that. And it'd probably be in a little bit more detail than that. So then you'd say, why are uh, existing solutions, are there any existing solutions for this? Um, like you have your card you can take with you, I guess, your student ID card. And why is that in, uh, why is that not, or why is that inadequate at solving these issues? Um, well, I guess it's hard to have all, all like all access on one card because you have to use it for UTA or like anything so you could forget it. It might not work for scanning. It's hard to like manage your account on there. Yeah. All right. So then you would say, okay, this is your one phrase. This is your company name and your one phrase solution, which is a card that does everything for your campus needs. You go into the details. Now, yours is a little bit hard because there's so many details. So we're not actually going to rate this while factor because you're going to get an accurate, an accurate, inaccurate score. But essentially, you would put the the details and then the summary and then the cost, which is going to be probably zero for students, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what he would do. But you can see already that with his idea, it's so big, it's very hard to make clear and concise and under one page. A lot of you are going to have that problem, which is why you have to really refine this. And you, the way you do it is you write it out, you go to a customer, you screen them to make sure they're in the target market, you show it to them, and then you ask if there's any questions they have. Is there anything that's ambiguous before they rate your wow factor? And it takes three or four or five iterations of this to actually get something that's clear and concise enough that you can take to a customer and everybody in a room knows exactly what you're doing and what you're talking about. So um, once you do that, you can, I'll give you guys these slides. You can go, there's some links to see some things. But uh, essentially, what we would do is we'd ask you, what's the wow factor on a scale of one to 10? And one is, eh, this is boring. And 10 equals, wow, here's my credit card. I want to buy that right now. And really, what happens is hundreds of startups been tested to create this scale, and if you score under five, then you don't have product market fit. So, either you have to change your product and try a completely different iteration of your product, like way different, your product sucks. If you get under five, they're really, like, I should show you some of my client's ideas, like they're terrible. <laughs> and then, if you, maybe you have a good product, but you're completely testing the wrong market. Maybe you thought it was new moms, that have their first child, but really it's moms that have their fifth child. Maybe you have to try a completely different market segment and that actually boosts up your wow factor score. So if you score at five to seven and a half, then your idea is too mediocre. The vast majority of ideas are too mediocre. Why would you spend all of your time when your chances of success are one out of 10 on something that's mediocre? You want to try something that is a great idea. So it has to score in that seven and a half range. Now, if you score like a 6.8, like right here is where most people score, there's things that you can do to boost your wow factor score, either iterating on the, the actual solution or by maybe narrowing down your target market or trying to do some combination of the two. Um, but until you have over 7.5, you don't have product market fit. And once you do have this, then you know, great, you have market desirability. 42% of businesses fail because of no market need. Well, you now hypothetically have validated there is a market need. It's worth testing. And now going into these rapid assumptions and MVPs. So once you pass the wow factor test, at that point is when you want to create your business model canvas. And that's when you're going to say, OK, here are the nine assumptions that I have to have right in order to have a viable business model. At that time is when you're actually going to be doing these rats and MVPs. So, um, we we're running a little low on time. So you're saying to get the seven point five before? Yes. The Why? Yeah. Because if you have a six point five, then you have to change something either huge with your market segment or with your problem, which, or with your problem with this. So you might have to change five or six of these things. Sure, you, as an exercise, you can absolutely do this if it doesn't take long. But don't try to go validate these solutions because you know, yeah. So the wild factor score, you have these three things. Technical feasibility, financial viability, and market desirability. 
42% of businesses fail because of this. Everybody thinks they have it because they themselves want it. Well, do other people actually want it though? So what it validates is on a scale of one to 10, how well does your solution deliver a unique value proposition to a customer segment who has a problem? And that's what that one score tells you in one number, which is awesome because if that's, if that's all correct, then you now know you can go do these things. Um, the last thing I want to tell you is with this, there's an order in how you tell your story and there's an order in how you validate. And so I got like six out of 6,000 in my year for IBMC, all because I told the story in the correct way. And the way you tell your story is, here's a customer segment who has this problem. Everybody always says it differently. They say, hey, Here's a solution, I have my solution now. Let me go try to find a problem that it solves. And are there any customers that have this problem? And they end up having their solution, their baby, and they don't want you to call it ugly, so they don't actually go get validation. And they spend a lot of their time trying to prove that their hammer is good for these nails. Well, the better way to do it is say, hey, here's a customer who has a problem, here's a solution. But still, it's not the best, because it's gonna make you be attached to your solution because you thought of it, you're the inventor, and wow, you're really smart for thinking of this. The best way to do it is, here's a customer, here's a problem, I talk with them, and this is the value proposition they're missing from alternative solutions. This is what they really need. It doesn't matter how they get that, but this is what they need, and the solution is the vehicle that actually delivers that value proposition. So because of that, solutions are a dime a dozen. They aren't your babies. Solutions can be changed every single day as you try to find a different way to do the same job. Um, real quick, so here's my business model canvas for, for one I did. It was uh, mid-sized grocery markets were my customer, and they had a problem that they were losing $141,000 annually per store on expired food. The existing solutions uh, weren't working. Um, I'll skip why, but I found out that the unique value proposition was they wanted to be able to identify food automatically and be able to discount it automatically. And so I knew that whatever my solution did had to do this. And so the first thing I tried was an RFID tag and putting the expiration date in that. And I found out in one day that that was a bad solution because it didn't deliver this value proposition. I was later at a conference in Milan, Italy where I met Wasteless, this company had been doing RFID tags for two years, and they had just a week before finally invalidated that RFID tags would work, and they were now pivoting. Two years, this guy had raised over a million dollars, and I found it <coughs> one day because I said, hey, this is what they need, there's no way that can deliver it. So the next thing I said, okay, well, what about uh, QR code? And then I also found out in one day, hey, QR code can't work, it can't be dynamic. These packages are printed up three months before they actually have food in it, and so that's not gonna work. And so then I said, okay, well, what about having the expiration date uh, inkjet printed on at the same time that they put the human readable expiration date on the bag? And that had a lot of success, and because of that, then I said, okay, now, who are my early adopters? And then how do I actually get to them? It was trade shows and conferences. And then what were the licensing, what were the revenue streams for that? How much did it cost me to actually deliver that? And then what made me protectable? And so that's the way you go about the canvas. And these key metrics are how you know if you're doing well. In a corporation, your key metrics are gonna be usually your revenue. How much revenue and profit do you have? But in a startup, we usually don't have revenue or we don't have enough revenue for us to know if that's a good, if we're actually have a good pulse on where we're going. So for each and every single business, there are key metrics that you have to hit. And you need to find out what those are for your business idea and track those, and that's how you know if you're actually doing good. So um, when we go to this slide here, you've now passed the wow factor test, you've built your business model canvas right here because you're in the model stage, and you are now going to do rapid assumption tests, which will test one to maybe three of these assumptions. Um, so, real quick example, there's a student here two or three years ago who has this robot that was going to teach children how to read, who was going to play tag with them, and was gonna have uh, a video project 
from the, this little kind of BB-8 type thing and, and teach kids, um, or I guess show kids these things and they fuck me. Well, what he was trying to build was like a million dollar bill for something to do all those technical things way too hard. What I was trying to tell him is, hey, why would you go and build that when you don't know if it has market demand? Why don't you test each one of those features with a wrap to find out if it's actually needed? So, for example, he had to test if it had um, enough demand for his projector, which would then show you videos. Well, a really easy rack was he already had a projector to put it in the phone core of his little BB-8 robot and to then take pictures of a Dr. Seuss book, every single page, and then narrate the book, put it into a video, and then now put that on the projector and have a child's parent play them a book once every single night and then see is there traction here? Does, does the child actually ask for it? Do they want it? Because everyone has tablets today. Maybe they don't want that projector. Maybe they don't care. And of his build, that was, I think, 50% of his cost was that mini projector. So with a little rapid assumption test, in your business models, you're looking, what is a little rapid assumption test that I can do that, sure, that wasn't the whole solution, but you validated that little portion, and now know you can go forward. Um, we're running out of time, so Right here, you then create a minimum viable product. Um, there's a lot to go into that and cheaper ways to do that, but we don't have time. Essentially, the way you measure if your minimum viable product is doing well is if it hits these key metrics. And if you hit those key metrics, then you say, okay, is my customer acquisition at more than 40% coming in from unpaid sources? If so, you now have every single thing ready to scale. And if you're at that point, then if you raise money right here, you're gonna get a wicked high valuation for giving away very little, little equity because you've completely de-risked your business. So many people try to raise money when they're idea, in the idea phase. Their valuation is very, very small because they have so much risk. And so the people you're trying to get money from are the three Fs, friends, families, and fools, and then the two Ds, doctors and dentists. So you're not getting a lot of money. He probably has a dad as a dentist. No, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, <laughs> so if you if you try to raise in the model phase, the problem is as soon as you raise money, you are essentially concreting your business model canvas. And it's very, very hard to pivot. Because as soon as you raise money, you just told investors, hey, this is my business model canvas and it's completely right. Here's my pitch. We know everything, they give you money. And for you to find out you're wrong and completely change directions on them when they give you money for that is very hard to do. And I'd say probably 75% of companies don't do that and they keep plowing on and doing the vision that they sold and they die. So that's why you don't want to raise money in here. And then in the traction phase, once you have everything with all your metrics right and you wait and you now build out the infrastructure to scale, as soon as they give you that money, it's all built for completely finishing your product, and then now sales. And that's how you get hockey stick grow. Yeah? What uh, phase of this are we supposed to be in for competition? Right here. Model and maybe traction. Okay. Would you agree with that, Jeff? Yeah, for sure model. Okay. It, it, some people will be in traction. Yeah, very, like, I don't think anybody will be in build. There probably won't be anybody in scale. You have to be past idea. So really, you're going to be Rapid assumption tests and MVPs are where most people would be. So that's the why. The whole why and why we're doing this small competition is because most people, they raise money here, they don't even know this graph exists, they raise money here, they've locked in their business model, and then they fail. And they wasted all their money, they burned their bridges, they've now ruined Thanksgiving and Christmas with their family, and <laughs> it's terrible. But if you do things right and you say, hey look, the first thing we're doing is testing market desirability, we pass that, now let's find out what rapid assumption tests can we do, cheap ways to evaluate your business model, and go on from there. We're de-risking it while increasing investment size. So that's all I have for you. Um, I do have a class that will be teaching next semester where we're pretty much using this format. If you have an idea or if you don't have an idea, we are going to, it's, it's a very different class. It's a, an idea accelerator. So <coughs> we're going to come in for the first month, and you're going to come to class and learn this process and a lot more of the specifics on the how-to. And then you're pretty much set free for the rest of the semester to go and do work on your business. 
doing things that actually matter, that are gonna be busy work assignments, it's actually gonna be validation on your business, and then uh, at the end of the semester, you pretty much report how you did. If you're interested in that, um, I'd like you to come up here and put your name down. We're trying to find out which day of the week we're setting this class up. But other than that, that's all I have, so I'll turn it back to Jeff. All right, thank you, Eric. Um, that was really awesome stuff, Eric. Uh, really, really great stuff. So we did, we, the great thing is we recorded this presentation, and so we will make it available after the fact. Um, so if you know of people who didn't come and with uh, value here, please uh, make them aware. Or if you were kind of coming in and out or whatever and weren't able to get everything, um, you'll have access. But the way you get access to that is, um, we did scan cards on the way in, so we'll get some information there. Let's see here, tech putting that's what I want. Um, but if you could get out your phones and scan this, send us your email. Um, it's just a quick a one question survey that just you put in your email. And we will send you tonight all the slides and also some more information about uh, where you can put in that URL. Um, and I'll take you to the survey. And then fill that out, we'll send you all the information. The last thing I will tell you is um, the most difficult thing we have with students is the is this you're scared to share your idea because the number one thing is you think it's going to get stolen and I will tell you that that's that's the one biggest hurdle that we face with this competition is because you have to talk with a lot of people right so the key things there are really the, the most key thing is execution is what matters. And the fact that you are passionate about this idea, not, other, not, not anyone else, right? You're the one who's passionate about it, and you're the one who's going to execute on it. Think Facebook, right? That's what matters, is execution. Um, and so, uh, yes, don't go and like talk with a direct competitor and maybe share everything, like how you're different, and like the secret sauce of your company. That's probably not a great idea. But um, you, know, you should learn from your competitors. Uh, and but you should definitely talk with your customer, like who you, who you think your customer is, and obviously change who you, you know change your interviewing with the customers based on the feedback that you get. But again, I can't tell you enough. Your idea is not going to get stolen. Okay, um, you need to make sure that you're you're getting out there and getting feedback. Um, that's so so valuable. So so valuable if you're really serious about actually launching your idea. I know all of you think I have the next Google. I can't share because it's going to be like the next big thing. And like Eric said, that probably is that probably could be it could be right, but I'm telling you it's probably not. And so <laughs> the most important thing is that you're learning this process. You're learning how you're going to create value in the marketplace, and that's the process that we teach you in the business model competition. And then. You know, you know, when you have that, when you have those better ideas coming in the future, you can actually use this process to really produce results. All right, that's all thing. Everything we have tonight. Um, yes, question. Yeah, first, does it work? Yeah. Well, so working? You just have to go to preview, and then you can submit your own. Then you go up to the settings, and you share. You click the three button. What did you share? Share for So when you open it. <laughs> you basically shared the like the copy that you did. I can see all the responses too. Oh really? Oh man, that's awesome. So, that question. Well, we didn't think that through very well. I have another question. Like, yeah. Who, uh, what about if we already have revenue for the company? Like, yeah. Uh, can we compete? Like, yeah. Sort of, like, so we have a different competition for that. It's called the Student Entrepreneur of the Year. Um, that's for companies that have revenue and profits. Um, that's probably more. It depends when you got it, right? If it was and, yeah. So I mean, if you got, if you had revenue and profits during, there is criteria uh, related to that. So if you have it during this comp, during this school year, um, significant. As long as it's not significant, then you what can still. Your we we probably to talk personally about it. I said a hundred thousand. Yeah. So we, yeah, you want you want to look at the judging criteria um, on that um, with another competition series. Or something. Yeah. 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 All right. Um, we have uh, versions of the Lean Canvas if you want to take one uh, as you leave tonight. I apologize for the QR code. Somebody else created that and you know, didn't fully test it before we put it up on the screen. So, but we do have you if you slide if you slide your card, we will get you an email and we can uh, reach out to you and ask you if you can, if you can allow us to send you the information.